Last year, as an architecture photographer, I made $148,123. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you exactly where that money came from. But first, I'm going to help break down the three most common pricing structures that architecture and interior photographers use. Then we'll see how these prices play out as we dissect a handful of invoices from real jobs that A&D photographers from around the US have billed their clients. Next, I'll show you some of the business expenses you can expect to encounter that will take away from your bottom line revenue each year. And finally, I'll open up my personal finances and show a pie chart of the different income streams that make up my yearly income. So by the end of this video, you should be able to determine how much money is possible for you to make as an architecture photographer if you choose to go down this career path. Most architecture and interior photographers price their services in one of three ways, an hourly rate, a day rate, or a creative fee and a licensing fee structure. Now, it's important to note that there are other price structures out there, and there is no right or wrong way of billing a client for your work. We also need to keep in mind that every photographer and scenario is different, and these methods won't work for every person on every job. There truly is no one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to pricing photography. These are just three of the most common ways of going about it and some of my general thoughts on each. So with all that said, first we have the hourly rate. An example of this would be if a photographer charges $250 per hour and is on site for eight hours, they would bill the client $2,000 and deliver however many photos they shoot during that time. Maybe it's 20 photos, but maybe it's 60 or more. Part of the problem with this is that it incentivizes your clients to rush through the photographic process, which doesn't allow for the best creative work possible. As a creative professional, I strongly believe we should get paid based on the value we bring to a client, not the time we give them. And that's why I strongly discourage for photographers from charging this way. Next, we have the day rate price method, which almost always includes the subtext of a half day rate as well. In this structure, a photographer will shoot for a full day, usually up to eight hours, but maybe up to 10, for a flat rate. So this might be $2,000. Or they will offer a half day, which is usually up to four or five hours for a reduced flat rate, so maybe $1,200. And for each of these rates, they may or may not put a cap on the number of photos produced during that time. So one photographer might charge $2,000 for a full day and cap the number of photos at 25, while another photographer might charge the same amount but will deliver 70 images from that shoot. One of the big differences here is that if you only shoot 25 photos of the, over the course of eight hours, you'll most likely put more time and effort into composing, styling, and lighting each of those images. Whereas if you shoot 70 photos in eight hours, there's no way you can put the same amount of attention to detail into each image because there's just not enough time in the day. And finally, we have the creative fee plus licensing fee structure. For example, a photographer may charge $1,000 as a creative fee, which is the price to show up with their gear ready to get after it. And then they will charge $100 as a licensing fee per image. So if they shoot 10 photos at $100 each, that's $1,000. Add that to the $1,000 creative fee and the total for that shoot is $2,000. This is the way I structure my prices and typically the way I would recommend that most other photographers charge as well. So let's talk about why. First, when explaining your rates and fees to your clients, you allow yourself to be able to explain what the licensing fees are, the fees to use the images. This gives you the perfect opportunity to go over in detail what they can and can't do with the photos, and oftentimes equally as important, what you can and can't do with them. It also allows you to make a predetermined minimum amount of money for the job while allowing your clients to get what they pay for. So if they want more photos, they pay more, and if they want less photos, they pay less. Personally, there's a dollar amount that will get me excited enough to get up, charge and pack my camera gear, load up the car, kiss my wife and kid goodbye, drive across town, and give my absolute best effort on a job. Anything less than that dollar amount, and frankly, I may show up with really low energy that just doesn't get me pumped up to do the work, which isn't fair to my clients or myself. So by setting the creative fee at a place where I'm all in on that job, I know that I'll at least make X amount of dollars and I'll be able to to be happy with that regardless of how many images I shoot that day. And I go into that workday knowing that if I work longer, presumably I'll shoot more and then I'll get paid more based off the additional licensing fees. And if I shoot less and work less, I'll make less money, but I'll also get home quicker. Another reason why this price structure is so beneficial is that it truly reflects the get paid based on your value philosophy of this business. You can adjust both the creative fee and licensing fee depending on any factor that's thrown your way. 
the type of client or the size of the client, the intended usage of the photos, and the list goes on. And because you're getting paid based on the value that your images provide, you have an easy explanation as to why an invoice you send a client might be different than another. And one of the most important reasons that the creative fee and licensing fee structure is beneficial to us as architecture and interior photographers is that it helps protect us when our images get used without permission and legal action has to be taken in order to get compensated for that IP infringement. Now that we've seen a few ways to get a base price for our services, what happens when more than one company wants to use our photos? Well, remember, we're getting paid based on the value we bring to companies. So if more companies use the images, the more valuable those images are. So that means we get paid more. The most common way of licensing images from a shoot to multiple companies at one time is what we in the industry affectionately call cost sharing. And no discussion about pricing would be complete without mentioning it. Just like base prices, there are a number of ways we can do this. But what most a photographers consider to be the industry standard is a 30% markup or cost share surcharge per additional company or license. So if a photo shoot is quoted at $2,000 and a second project partner says they will want to use the photos produced during that shoot, you can add 30% or $600 to that quote, bringing the new total to $2,600. Now the two companies can split that bill down the middle and each only pays $1,300. They both get a $700 discount and you get $600 more for doing the same amount of work. Everyone wins in this scenario. And for every additional company that wants a license to use the images, you just add another 30%. So if three companies want to share costs on that same $2,000 shoot, you'd add $1,200. That's the 30% surcharge times two, which gives you a total of $3,200. And if the three companies split that bill evenly, they all only pay $1,066. Each time you add more licenses and companies to that bill, their discount increases, but so does your payment. Again, everyone wins. My personal policy for most cost sharing scenarios is that each party must agree to the cost sharing model before the shoot. Each party involved receives all of the photos from the shoot, only one client directs the shoot, only one client provides feedback for retouching or changes, and only one client is billed for the shoot, meaning the original commissioning client will pay me one lump sum and they are responsible for collecting payments from the other companies based on however they decide to split that bill. If we extrapolate on each of these price structures, we can start to get a general idea of what is possible when it comes to how much money an architecture and interior photographer can make in a year. Again, these are general ideas and base prices. They don't include cost sharing or relicensing of images after the fact, which are both industry standards in this field that every architecture interior photographer should be including in their business model. So let's go through some made up scenarios of things that could happen in real life. And as we do this, keep in mind that it's totally up to you to decide if these kinds of prices and outcomes would fit your personal situation. You can decide if you think the amount earned is good or not, and you can decide if you think the amount of work produced is realistic for you. Say a photographer charges $150 an hour and stays on site for an average of five hours per shoot. A typical week for them includes two shoots, so that's 10 hours of billable time per week. And let's say they are consistent enough to replicate these two shoots a week for 45 weeks out of the year, factoring in some time there for a vacation, a week where they might be sick, and a few slow weeks. That would yield a gross income of $67,500. So that's money before taxes and expenses are taken out. Let's say another photographer is just starting out, so they only charge $100 per hour. And their clients are relatively small, so they only spend an average of four hours on site per shoot, which brings our average shoot price to $400. And because they are still building their client base, they only average one shoot every other week. So that's 26 shoots throughout the year at $400 each generating $10,400 for the year. Now we'll look at a photographer who charges $1,500 for a full day and $800 for a half day shoot. They might average 66 shoots in a year, about five or so every month. And a third of them are a half day shoot. So out of their 66 shoots, 22 of them are half day shoots and the remaining 44 are full days. This would produce a total yearly income of $83,600. Remember, as we continue through this exercise, start to think about how many shoots you think is realistic for you to do in a week, a month, or a year, and how much money you think you should charge, and compare that to how much money you'd like to make. And if you feel like you need some help figuring out these numbers in a way that makes a little more sense for you, 
send me an email so we can set up a consulting call. Okay, let's jump to a really experienced photographer who charges $3,500 for a full day shoot and $2,000 for a half day. And this person stays busy with 90 shoots throughout the year. That's about two a week for 45 weeks out of the year. Again, taking a few weeks off for various reasons. Out of the 90 shoots, let's say that only 20 of them are half days and 70 are full days. This kind of workflow would result in $285,000 for the year. Now let's look at a few examples of a photographer that uses the creative fee and licensing fee price structure. Pretend we have a photographer that just started using this type of pricing and they set their creative fee at $500 per day and tack on $50 for each photo as the licensing fee. Now, not that it should dictate what anybody else does at all, but this is exactly where I set my prices when I started doing this in 2017. We'll say this person's average shoot produces 15 photos, so an average invoice for them is $1,250. If they did a shoot about every other week for the year, this would result in $33,750 of annual revenue. And one final scenario to look at is a photographer who has a creative fee of $2,000 a day and a licensing fee of $150 per photo. If this person's average shoot was 20 images and they shot 55 projects throughout the year, their annual income could be $275,000. As you can see, there is a massive sliding scale of what's possible when it comes to how much a photographer can make each year shooting architecture and design. I would encourage you to set really intentional goals for your life, then reverse engineer those in order to come up with how many shoots per year you'd like to do and at what price point. You can then play with and tweak the numbers to something that is realistic for your own situation and work towards those goals, tracking them each quarter or year. My current goal is to shoot 40 projects for the year with an average bill of $4,000 each, which would result in $160,000 a year from photo shoots. All right, now that you have the foundational information needed to understand how you can price A&D photography, let's get away from the hypothetical situations and look at some real world examples of how this has played out for photographers from around the US. What you're about to see are actual invoices I've received from working professionals in this industry. The people, locations, and companies will remain anonymous, but I can assure you they are all legit. And for the sake of time and keeping on topic, we won't go over the exact usage agreement or other terms and conditions on these. We're mainly just focused on the numbers here. First up, we have a pretty basic shoot of a residential home for a local architect. This photographer charged $1,250 as a creative fee and $100 per image for the licensing fees. So after producing 12 images over the course of about six and a half hours on site, the total bill for this project was $2,450. I said these would remain anonymous, but since I'm trying to be transparent here, I can tell you that this one is one of my invoices and the next one is too. This invoice was billed to a national construction company from a shoot of a medical facility. I live in Hawaii and traveled to one of our neighbor islands for this shoot, flying there and back in the same day. So the bill included $470.77 worth of travel expenses. The creative fee on this one was set to $1,750 and there were 13 licensing fees at $100 each. The commissioning client brought on two additional companies that wanted a license to use the photos, the development company and the tenant of the building, which again was a medical facility. So the fees for those additional licenses added $1,830 to the invoice. And here in Hawaii, we have to charge a general excise tax so after that was added, it brought the grand total of this shoot to $5,580.72. This total was billed to and fully paid by the general contractor and they collected payments from each of the other two companies. So each company ended up only paying about $1,860 for their portion of this shoot. Next, we have a two-day shoot of a luxury high-rise apartment building that yielded 22 finished images. The shoot was a little more in-depth and involved the client arranging to have models on site during the shoot. The fees were broken down into a $5,000 photographer creative fee for the two days and photo editing fees of $125 each. There's also a line item of $1,000 per day for an assistant that was brought on for the job. The total bill was $9,750, excluding a hotel that the client also provided for the photographer. Now we move on to an invoice that was billed with a flat day rate of $2,400. This was a residential shoot for an interior designer and the photographer was on site for about eight hours and delivered 70 photos when all was said and done. The last invoice we will look at bills for a day rate with a cap of 25 photos and a maximum of 10 hours on site. This shoot included interior and exterior images of a residential home, and it was shot for an interior designer who brought on the builder to help share the cost in return for a license to use the assets. 
In this instance, both companies were built separately. So we're just looking at one of those two bills here, which shows a day rate of 3,200 and a 30% cost sharing discount. After adding the local sales tax, each client paid $2,432, which gave the photographer a total of $4,865 for this work. It's always fun to see what kind of money people make, but what about how much money people spend? I'm a very frugal person and try to pinch pennies whenever possible, but in 2022, I still spent more than $23,000 on business expenses and paid more than $26,000 in taxes. So with more than $50,000 leaving my bank account in the year, you can see that takes a big chunk out of the money I bring in from the kinds of invoices you just saw. I'm not an accountant and this is not financial advice, but I save 20% off the top of every paycheck I receive to set aside for taxes. So a $2,000 paycheck very quickly becomes just $1,600. As a side note, I also put 10% into a retirement type investment account and another 10% into a general savings account for things like traveling and general backup funds. So for me personally, a $2,000 paycheck actually only puts $1,200 into my checking account that goes towards my monthly bills and regular business expenses. Anyway, where do these expenses come from and how do you know if you'll have similar business expenses? Well, here's a short list of some of the things you can expect to pop up throughout any given year. Random pieces of camera and lighting gear, $1,700. And that's if you don't have any major upgrades, which for me tends to happen every four years or so. If you purchase a new camera body or lens, then obviously that number will shoot up much higher very quickly. Then you have hard drives and other random bits of computer equipment, 650 bucks. Again, that's if you don't have to upgrade your entire computer setup. Business insurance, that's $700. The Adobe Creative Suite, another $600 for the year. Dropbox or a different file delivery service, 125 for the year. Microsoft Office, that's 100 bucks. Pixie or another photo tracking service to monitor if your images have been stolen, $430. Printing portfolio books, business cards, and other promo materials as 500. Accounting, registering your photos with the copyright office and other legal fees. Let's call that 1700. Then we have memberships to industry organizations and the events they hold. That's thousand dollars. And then there are countless other little odds and ends that accumulate over time, like postage and shipping, parking, meals and client gifts, and random office supplies. Now, as promised, this is the part of the video where I give you an in-depth look at how much money I personally make as an architecture photographer and where exactly that money comes from. The reason I'm opening up so much here and being so vulnerable is because I know it's so difficult to get straight answers about money and finances. And I wanna break that wall down as a way to help educate people who are working in this field or who are considering this kind of work. I wanna make it very clear here that I'm not trying to brag. While I'm proud of what I made, Honestly, I didn't reach the goals I set for myself, and I've set higher goals for this year. In saying this, I'm not suggesting that you strive for anything more or less than I made, and I'm not suggesting that any particular dollar amount equals any type of success. Money is very personal to everyone, and we all have different desires, goals, living expenses, personal situations, and so on. So what you make or want to make or how you define success is totally up to you. The only thing I encourage is to be very intentional about how you define your terms and how you design your life and what goals you set for yourself. I promise I'm not intentionally trying to drag this out, but I do feel I need to preface this with one more very important point. Most people I know that consider themselves professional architecture and interior photographers have multiple income streams. Some still generate revenue from a previous industry they worked in. Some have a real estate media company in addition to their A&D clients. Some do video work either for the same kinds of A&D clients or for different types of clients. And I know photographers that do branding, portraits, headshots, or other types of photography as well. And others like myself sell educational content. And of course, there are many reasons why people don't just stick to one thing. They enjoy other types of photography. They have passions for other things, yada, yada, yada. But let's not try to hide the elephant in the room here. Building up an architectural photography business takes time and if you don't have multiple sources of income while you're working on building your portfolio, clientele, and business, there's a good chance you won't make it in the long run. At the time of this recording, I'm less than three years into the new market I moved to back in November 2020, and I'm still working on building up my client base here. So currently, I have three main income streams that I consider to be an integral part of my business. Shooting, licensing, and education. 
Shooting is pretty self-explanatory. Clients hire me to shoot photos and I get paid for it. Licensing has two parts. First, I'm very proactive in relicensing my existing photos. So if an interior designer hires me to shoot a residential home, I'll try to relicense the kitchen photos to the cabinet company or the faucet company, or both. Or if an architect hires me to photograph a high rise, I'll try to relicense some of those images to the structural engineer. And for whatever reason, I got really good at this whole licensing thing. Spotting which products stayed out in a photo, figuring out who made those products, finding the right person to contact at that company, and knowing exactly what to say to them in an email are weird little niche skills that I've developed. So now I work with other photographers from around the country as a licensing agent. They send me their photos, so I broker licensing deals with product vendors for them, and then we split the money. So licensing is my second stream of income. My third income stream is education, and this came as a direct result of that weird niche skill I just described. Back in 2020, I released an online course where I teach you how to do all the things needed to license your photos and bring in extra money just like I do. After that course had been out for a while, I started getting other ideas for things I wanted to teach. So I began hosting online workshops, which led to releasing other downloads for sale and doing one-on-one -on -one consulting calls with photographers who are looking for specific help either with their skills or in their business. So selling educational resources is my final method of making money. In 2022, I made $69,150 from photo shoots, $46,227 from licensing sales, and $32,525 from the educational stream. Now, let's break these down even further. In 2022, I did 16 architecture design photo shoots at an average price of $3,875 each. Six of those were commercial and 10 of them were residential. Nine of them involved cost sharing with additional project partners. I also billed $1,250 for some raw drone footage that a client asked for, even though I don't typically offer video services. I also reluctantly agreed to five short-term rental shoots at an average of $800 each, which gave me an extra $4,000 in the photo shoot category. I keep swearing I will not shoot rentals or real estate, but every once in a blue moon, I agreed to a shoot for one reason or another and usually end up regretting the decision. For example, I would have had another $1,000 of income from a real estate shoot on this list, but the homeowner wasn't happy with the photos, so I gave her a full refund and told her she wasn't allowed to use them. Anyway, I digress. To cap off my photo shoot income for 2022, I did two shoots that I would classify as random. One for a yoga studio that my wife was doing social media for, and these were action shots during the classes and not architectural shots of the space and one corporate headshot session for an architecture firm that I was trying to build a relationship with. I also regretted that one. The whole shoe was a complete cluster muck. I had one flash with an umbrella on it, just Mary Poppins it straight off a three-story roof, and another flash that was thankfully weighted down better broke the light stand in half due to the wind. So just like with that real estate shoot that I refunded, with this headshot session, I was reminded why I should always say no to the kinds of jobs that I know I don't want to do anyway. Stay in your lane, Adam. Stay in your lane. Again, I digress. Getting back on track. When it comes to the licensing sales, $10,058 was from my own photos. I licensed 41 of them at an average price of about $245 each. The other $36,169 of licensing income was my cut from the other photographers I work with, which means they also got paid pretty well too. And that always makes me happy. Together, we licensed 206 images with an average payout of $350 per image. The reason my own photos were priced less than my clients is because a lot of what I licensed for myself were to local project partners like contractors and architects and not national product vendors. And remember, we get paid based on value, so companies with larger reaches pay more. If you want to learn all the tactics and techniques that I use to license all of these photos, sign up for my Learn to License Your Photos course. I literally teach everything I do exactly as I do it to make these sales. And licensing just one photo to a product company usually pays you back for the entire course. Moving on to the education component of my income. $5,169 of that was through one-on-one -on -one consulting calls and $1,300 was from helping people design their printed portfolio books. Then another 10,343 was from my licensing course and $15,713 was from the workshops I hosted. And just to be super accurate here, I had another $550 of income from old stock photos and videos I had given to other platforms a long time ago. 
I really wrestled with the idea of charging for this video or making it a pay what you want donation kind of thing, or at least putting it behind an opt-in curtain so you had to put in your email address to access it. But after it was all complete, I truly just felt like this kind of information and pricing transparency would help a lot of people. So when I reflect back on my goal and intention of this video, it was clear that it needed to be just out there for everyone to see. So I hope you got a lot out of it and I hope you consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, signing up for my email list, or jumping on some of the paid content that I offer. Links to all of that are in the description below. Thanks for watching and best of luck to you as you navigate this challenging but rewarding and super fun career path.